Today's podcast is brought to you by New Media, spelled N-U-M-E-D-I-A, the streaming media company that's taking on the big cable and satellite providers. If your cable bill has gotten out of control, listen up. You can get this amazing app at getnewmedia.com. It works on your TV with Amazon Fire Sticks and on tablets, phones, and devices. It's a convenient and cost-effective way to watch live HD TV and all your favorite premium channels. This isn't your typical TV app, like, you know, those big companies. New Media has 2,000 channels with all the bells and whistles for one low price. You'll get beautiful live HD TV, over 100 children's news and entertainment channels, premium movie channels like Showtime, Cinemax, Stars, and HBO, dozens of sports channels, you'll never miss a game. A huge selection of international channels, something for everyone. Pay-per-view is also included in the new media package. There are no long contracts, it's pay-as-you-go, no hidden fees, or TV box rentals. As a new media member, you can use this app on up to five TVs or devices. The main requirement is a solid internet connection. That's it. GetNewMedia.com is the website to get all this for only $49.95 per month. That's G-E-T-N-U-M-E-D-I-A dot com. You'll thank me later. Welcome to Oh Hell No with Nicole. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today we have Peesh Patel, yep. right? Peesh. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here with me, Peesh. Everyone, he is um, a teacher turned entrepreneur turned author. So we're going to get into his story. So the first thing I'd like to ask is, where did you grow up? I was born in London, England, but I grew up in a little town in Oklahoma called El Reno. Oh, okay. Wow. All right. So tell me three things that you are passionate about. I am passionate about education. I am passionate about kids. And I am passionate about helping others. Have you always been passionate about education and kids? Um, Yeah, I think that's growing up in an environment where your parents are always pushing you because you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of developed the, well, screw you guys. I'm just going to go be a teacher and help other kids not have to do that. So, (laughs) um, yeah, always tried to buck the system. Always fantasized about how I would teach the class way better than the teacher could. Really? So you consider yourself to just have been like an average student? Oh, totally. Oh, wow. Totally average student. Okay. So what led you down the path to becoming a sixth grade science teacher at that? Because science is not easy. Um, Well, actually, I started my education, you know, my family's from India. So (laughs) that means I get a choice between lawyer, doctor or engineer. Um, (laughs) And so I chose engineer. And I was in the engineering program, the electrical engineering program for at my college for three and a half years. And I'll be honest with you, I hated every bit of it. And I walked, I was walking by the College of Education and I just walked in and said, hey, what could I transfer into? And they were like, "Uh, pretty much anything. You want to teach science? I was like, that sounds great. And they're like, okay, high school? I was like, no, how about middle school? And they're like, yeah, perfect. Here you go. And so I graduated with my undergrad in elementary ed with the emphasis with uh, middle school math and science. And then I did my master's degree in adult education. Wow. So what did you love the most about teaching? Um, You know, it was just really about creating new trajectories for people. I mean, I could, the company that I built was all around education. And when I taught, I taught sixth grade science uh, for a while. And then I moved to the college level and I taught college students. Um, Being a professor was really um, fulfilling. In all of these instances, it was a chance to take a student who was on one path and really grab them and take them off in a different direction. You know, I'm really proud to say that I've created some really successful people. And I know I've, because they've told me, I've single-handedly had a chance to do that. And that's, there's not many professions left in the world that can have that much impact in people's lives. Yeah, absolutely. So what did your parents say when you said, you know what, I'm going to be a teacher now? (laughs) So (laughs) my parents said to me, If you are smart enough to be a teacher, you're smart enough to pay for school. Mm. And I said, yep, you know, you know, that's no problem. 
and I was broke by the end of the semester. I had to I joined the army to pay my way through both my degrees, and um, that conversation was the last day I ever took a penny from my parents. Wow, good for you. So, what was the most challenging part of teaching? Um, the challenging part, especially teaching the little kids, mm -hmm. was the parents. So. Uh, I remember the day I, I came home and told my wife that I can't do this anymore. I've got to teach older kids. I, I did a unit on astronomy, and I always start my classes off with, okay, what's astronomy? And, of course, the little hands go up, and I'm like, yep. And they're like, Mr. Patel, astronomy is like Cancer, Libra, um, you know, Gemini. And I'm like, no, no, that is astrology, mm -hmm. not astronomy. And I honestly spent like 30 seconds on the topic just to clarify so we can get on with it. Mm -hmm. And the next day, I got a letter from a parent who said, how dare you teach my child about the occult? Oh, geez. And I was like, really? Like, and that went to my boss, who went to the principal, who went to the superintendent. And I had to go to a hearing. I mean, it was like, it turned out to be this huge deal. And I was like, well, folks, what are you trying to protect your kids from? And I came home and told my wife, I was like, I can't change the world with these little kids because their parents won't let me. So I'm going to go teach at the college level where I can have more influence on them. Right. Oh, my goodness. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't. Um, so what ha so that is that the thing that led you to believe that you had a bigger purpose or so like after you were teaching and stuff and you went into being a professor, what was it that made you know that? there's something more for me to do before you got into like your business? Well, this was in um, early 2099, that window of time, you know, years before Google, seven years before YouTube. And so people really didn't use the internet like they do today. They just, you know, it's just information sharing and chatting and talking and finding stuff. So um, as a, as a professor, my challenge was to, my promise to my students was we're going to help you get a job in the visual effects industry. The problem was it's, it was a two year, two and a half year program. By the time you graduated, the software had changed so much from when you started that you really hadn't mastered it. And so the school wanted to constantly focus on what was new. And so you knew the latest software, you just didn't know it well. And so I went in kind of this entrepreneurial mindset. I went in and I made a big presentation to the, to the regents the school regents, and I said, here's what I'd like to do. I would like to cram the two and a half year degree into one semester. And they're like, what? How, how are you going to do that? I said, well, if we meet every single day, six days a week, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and only take a half hour lunch, and we don't take any holidays, my students can graduate with enough hours. Uh, we'll actually go over like 200 hours. Mm. And they were like, you are out of your mind. Like, they were like, we can't pay you to teach 42 credit hours. I said, well, you pay me for 12. What would you pay me to? And they're like, uh, 18. And I thought, well, 18 is more than 12. I'll take it. Wow. And so I started teaching 42 credit hours. And it, it was a slog. I mean, it was hard on me. It was hard on my staff. Uh, it was hard on the students. But these students were turning around. You know, they'd spend four or $5,000 for this degree because it was all crammed in. And they would turn around and get sixty, seventy thousand dollar a year jobs all over the world. It was just amazing. Wow! But it really took its toll on me. Um, my wife was pregnant at the time. I lived literally across the street from the college, and so across the street from my office, which was great until you think about you know it's nine thirty at night and kids would come over and ring the doorbell and the computer's not working, or Sunday afternoon my computer's not working. And I would go and help just because I'm across the street and I can help. And I was the closest staff member uh, or faculty member. But when my wife was pregnant, she was like, hey, this has got to stop. And at the same time, I was writing textbooks. So I wrote six textbooks and I completely got screwed on my royalty. And so it was just like this convergence of I'm not making enough money for the hours I'm putting in. Mm -hmm. These kids are bug bugging me all through the night and weekend. My book deal that I thought was great is terrible. And to fix all that, I started to record the week's lessons on video, and I would share them with my students, and they quit coming to my house. And one day, one of the students said, you should put this on the internet. And I was like, oh, man, who's going to want this stuff? And 
that night we had over a dozen orders from Asia Pacific without ads, without social media, nothing like old school word of mouth through the internet. Uh, by the end of the week, we were cash flow positive, and it was just this crazy thing that took off. Wow, that is so amazing. a long answer to your simple question. That is amazing. So that was the birth of your digital animation company, right? Or is that yeah, a different di- yeah. digital digital tutors? Yep. Wow. So, um, I was <laughs> my next question was going to be how long did it take you from the start to make you know money, but it seems like it was almost instantly it was um mind you the, the, it was hard work and sweat equity which was really that got us going so i would literally be in the classroom teaching from 8 a.m i would take my lunch with me oftentimes the kids want to eat with me and so i would get home around 7 30 um i make the dinners in my house so i'd come home cook dinner uh my wife and i would eat dinner we'd take care of our baby and then I would spend the night packaging DVDs and shipping them. I'd get those packages ready, and then I would drive to the FedEx drop-off, which was about 12 minutes away, uh, roughly 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning, do all that, go to bed, and then get up at 6 a.m. and do it again. And I did that for um, almost six months to get the business off the ground. Wow. So So I get the hard – I get the bootstrap, like – you know, grinding it out because we grew the business. Um, and you'll probably want to ask about this and get into this later, but you know, I grew it to $10 million in revenue and we did that with no investors and no debt. Like we literally bootstrapped it to 10 at, you know, a really high profit margin. So how long did it take to grow it to 10 million? Um, it was 14 years 14. and really the, the last bit of it happened towards the end. So, uh, we got it to about a million dollars, uh, over five or six years, it's really healthy, very profitable. And then we're like, let's just, let's put some gas on this. Like, let's really, let's quit shipping DVDs. We're going to go completely online. This was three years before Netflix went online. So our customers were like, what are you doing? I want the discs. And we're like, you don't want the discs. You want instant access. They're like, no, no, we want the discs. Trust me, you want instant access. So, mm-hmm. um, we fired all of our customers and, the next day, we sent out an email saying we're no longer shipping discs. Digital Tutors is closed. We have something exciting for you tomorrow. We relaunched Digital Tutors 100% online. You couldn't buy the discs. And we crossed our fingers. You know, like, well, I hope this works. Uh, and it worked. And that next year, we bumped up to $3 million, And then a year and a half later, we bumped up to $10 million, And then we were acquired for $45 million in cash and some stock. And that company merged into Pluralsight, which just did its IPO last week at a $1.7 billion market cap. So it's been an amazing ride to start with $54 and an idea and to see it now on NASDAQ. And essentially, the, you, you were basically doing your lesson on the video so people could go in and get a lesson. Right. Yeah. I mean, we essentially had... Oh my gosh, like 25,000 videos in our library Mm -hmm. for people who make movies and video games. Super niche. Kind of like a lynda.com or um, a Udemy. You know, it's like an online curriculum for visual effects artists. Wow. That is crazy. Super niche. That's that's really the way you build a business, right? Is um, I have this philosophy. Instead of trying to be something to everyone it's more powerful to be everything to someone. Right. And so if you were in the industry, we were your tribe. And if you wanted to learn how to use Excel, we're not your tribe. You're going to go find another resource for that. Right. So what did your parents have to say after that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty proud. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's pretty interesting because, you know, they, they're looking – uh, you can just see it on their face, but it's like, man, you, you really did go do it by yourself. Like, you know, you didn't take any help. You didn't ask us for help. And look, not to say it never crossed my wife and I's minds. I mean, there were many days when we knew we were not going to make payroll by Friday. And we had many conversations of, do we ask our parents for $800? I mean, we're $800 short on, you know, 30 people working for us with just a little bit short, what do we do? And the conversation always came back to, we're not taking a check this month. And, 
you know, the trust of my employees did the work and they trust that I'll pay them. If I break that trust, they'll never trust me again. And so me skipping a paycheck was way more important than breaking their trust. And my conversation with Lisa and my wife was, look, as long as we take care of our team, one day we'll get taken care of. So and that's what happened. That's a great segue into my next question, because I wanted you to tell us about some of the struggles that you faced with, you know, your business. And one of them you said was basically early on. Sometimes you guys weren't sure that you're going to make payroll. And what you did was you didn't take a paycheck. So in order to pay your employees, which is that's phenomenal, because I have worked at places where I got a paycheck and we would go to the bank and they'd be like, oh, there's no money there. So <laughs> I know what no, that feels like. <laughs> right. And that's terrible. And you do feel like you can't trust this employer and it's it's a terrible feeling. So I that's okay. really amazing that you guys did that. But what other struggles can you remember that you had just trying to grow the business? Yeah, well, I, I talk about this in my book. Like the one of the, the most glaring one was, you know, here we're making – you know, a million dollars a year, which trust me as a sixth grade science teacher, I never in my wildest dreams thought I would see an M find any figure right uh, outside of a statistic. So uh, to say, okay, wow, we're generating a million dollars in, in revenue. This is amazing. And at the same time, I hated going to the office. Like I, I did not want to go to the office. I didn't want to be, a, be involved. I was just, and it wasn't that I was bored. I, I was starting to lose track of who I was and what our mission was. And at the end of the day, I realized it was because we never defined our core values. And so this machine got bigger than I could manage it. I mean, it, you know, the pressure of, I had, you know, at that time, 25 employees, just the pressure of 25 mortgages and families. And some of those people were the only, um, you know, the sole breadwinner of that family. Uh, that was a lot of pressure to come home to every night. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really focused on who we are and what's our core values. And that's really how I fell back in love with the business. Nice. So that would be my biggest struggle. I mean, outside of the everyday stuff of running a business, right? Cash flow and people issues and customer issues, and just the struggle of running a business. But the biggest one was just my personal journey mm-hmm. to figure out who I was. So, I could make sure that the company never deviated from what was important to me. Yeah, that's a good one. So what made you decide to sell your company? You know, two things happened. Um, One, I got sick and I didn't know what was going on. I was having like my heart was having issues and um, I just was not feeling good. And then at the same time, I get this call from the CEO of Pluralsight, and he said, look, we're going to buy your company. And I was like, uh, okay, you know it's not for sale. I mean, we never discussed selling our company. It was making money. We were all having a great time. And uh, he's like, well, look, think about it. I'm going to be really honest with you. If we don't buy you, we're going to buy somebody like you. And, you know, we want to make sure it's you. We like you guys. We love what you're doing. And I came home that night, and I had a real heart-to-heart with my, my wife and and my son was sitting at the table, too, and I was like, okay, guys, what, what are we going to do? And I just had this flash of thinking, all right, am I going to you know, sling video for another 10 years and hope to God I can make this thing work every year? Um, but what if something happens to me, right? My wife doesn't know how to run this. My kid was 13 at the time. Um, and so I really had to think about what's best for them. And so we said, yeah, we'll sell the business. And so we closed in six weeks. It was just amazing. Like, it happened super fast. Wow. So when you sell a business like that, do you maintain any control? Are you still a part of it? Like what happens? Well, they, uh, I agreed to stay on for three years mm-hmm. and unfortunately I lasted six months. Um, one of my core values is do the right thing, even if it hurts. Mm-hmm. And what I found was the organization couldn't keep growing because they had two bosses all of a sudden, the boss that hired him and that's in the office. And then the boss that pays their paycheck and is asking them to do things. And so for them to be integrated and merged into a bigger culture, they would look to me and go, now what do we do? Please? And I was like, I don't know. Keep doing what we do. And they're like, okay. So they wouldn't do the things that needed to happen to really merge the cultures 
and the processes together. And I realized I was the bottleneck. And so, you know, I had a, a great salary and benefits and everything set up, but it wasn't living my core value for my employees. And so I bowed out and gave that control back to the organization so they could really merge and, you know, be stronger together than trying to be, you know, a business that they acquired, but is not fully in, incorporated into their organization, which is not fair to anybody involved. Right. So when you say you sold a business for 45 million, do you get that money? Or is that just how much the business was mm-hmm. worth and you get a certain amount of money? No, no. no ma'am. You- that's a pretty exciting day when your bank account has that in there. Holy cow. That's amazing. Yeah. You are my hero. Which, you know, <laughs> Well, listen, it, it opens up, it opens up a lot of other, other issues, right? No, I'm um, sure. With that song, No New Friends, right? Like, no, more money, more problems, more money, more problems. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the truth. I mean, Diddy had it right. I mean, the reality is, is I don't need any new friends. Right. right? Um, I, I'm raising a young man who is going to need to go make his life on his own. And my wife and I were really conscious that we can't really change our lifestyle until my son's out of the house because we don't want to model a lifestyle that he couldn't go live on his own, right? He's got to go create a family, get a job, be a member of society and not be a trust fund baby. And if we start blowing it out and having a great time and doing whatever we want to do, we're not good model parents for him. And so I'll be honest with you. It didn't really feel like much changed. (laughs) That's good though. I still go to work every day and just, you know, do my same thing and, we're still humble. We turn off the lights when we're not in the room, and my wife still clips coupons. I mean, I love you know, we, that. We grew up blue collar working parents, and we can't turn that off, and we don't want to turn it off, right? Then that's not who we are. Right. Absolutely. I love that. That's how I'm going to be when I get rich. Okay. Let me just tell you. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> that's right. Not, not, not if, when. Right. When, when. I have to be positive. That's right. So when did you become interested in writing again? Because I know you said your first book deal got all messed up. Um, so yeah. when did you get that bug again? Um, I was giving a keynote and somebody asked me, why haven't you written a book? Because this is the craziest roller coaster I've ever heard. And I was like, huh, I should write a book. And I just didn't want to write about the journey of an entrepreneur. I really wanted to write about how did we grow a technology business in the middle of the United States with 42 employees, 500 contractors, and we only turned over 12 people in 14 years, Wow! which in the tech world is unheard of. Yep. I All work in tech. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. And we did it without having like crazy salaries and, you know, this, this, the culture was all around something we call BAM, mm-hmm. belonging, affirmation, and meaning. And that's what we dialed in on, right? We really focused on building this culture where people are valued, people love coming to work, and people want to do their best for each other, not just for me. Yeah, that is nice. So your book is called Lead Your Tribe, Love Your Work. So in the book, you share great tips, and I want you to share some of those tips with us. So what should we be searching for in order to spot a toxic workplace before we accept an offer? All right, outside of all the normal stuff, Mm -hmm. every one of your listeners, if they are a team leader, supervisor, manager, or founder, I think you guys, as soon as you walk into your office today, or if you're listening at the office, get up while you're listening, go to the bathroom, and I want you to look at the toilet paper roll. If you are looking at an empty toilet paper roll, you have a really bad place of employment. Mm. And here's why. Your culture has developed a not my problem culture and not my job culture. And that's not a tribe. That's a bunch of individuals working in a room. Mm. And until people start to look at, oh, I've got to do this for my workmate, my tribe mate, then you really can't grow your culture and develop it because you within, you've already got an issue. I consulted for a large university and I shared this with them and they were like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up a contest and bring us an empty roll. We'll put your initial on it and then we'll draw one for a prize. And she said, what I actually did was 
I measured who brought roles in. And it turned out there were two people who would never bring in a role. And when we asked them, they were like, hey, that's not my job. That's why we have janitors. Mm. And they were like, yeah, we don't work that way. And they no longer work there, right? Right. They figured out where their problem was. They were like, these two folks were just thinking about themselves, wanting their own wins and not team wins. Yeah. Today I went to the bathroom and there was poop in the toilet. What does that mean? Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> I think that means your place of employment shitty. I don't know. <laughs> right. Exactly. You hit it right on the head. <laughs> <laughs> so um let's see the next one is what is an example of an uncomfortable conversation and how can we get positive results from tough questions right so let's think about it this way um people don't especially leadership they don't realize that their actions matter the things they say and do are magnified and if i praise you in the hallway and then tomorrow I chew you out in the hallway, you don't know which version of me you're going to get. Mm. And so I've told people, uh, everybody who works for me on their first day, they're all trained how to have this one sentence memorized, which is, I need to have an uncomfortable conversation with you. Now, when I say that, you know you're not getting a raise, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you know we're not... a about to give pats on the back, we're going to have to have an uncomfortable conversation. But I've also told you, this is really uncomfortable for me. And it also preps you like, okay, let me get in that frame of mind. And so we try not to hard, we try hard not to have these kind of conversations in my office, for sure. I don't want you coming in my office scared all the time. I'm not going to have it in the, in the hallway. I'm not going to have it at your desk. We actually have a little room called the principal's office. And I would just come up to you and say, hey, I need to have an uncomfortable conversation with you in the principal's office. And then we can go in there and have an uncomfortable conversation. I love that. That's so cute. And then you kind of just know, like, okay, we're going to talk about something that went wrong. And, you know, it's not going to be this, you know, situation where I'm being screamed at or talked down okay. to or, you know what I mean? Because I always feel like at work, you can have conversations about a mistake or about an issue without it being without the other person leaving feeling like a complete idiot you know that's right so we we developed and use a model called a grow model mm -hmm. g-r-o-w um and so what that would look like is i'd say all right look we need to have an uncomfortable conversation and you're going to say okay well, tell me about it and i'll say well look uh you you said you would have this story written by monday afternoon it's now Thursday afternoon, and, and you still haven't gotten to the story. So that's my goal. My goal was, our goal was, you were going to have this story written by Monday. The reality is, the R, the reality is it's Thursday, and it's still not done. The O and the W stand for options, and the W is all the W words, right? What, will, and when. Mm -hmm. And so now it's your turn. You're going to say, okay, here's some options. And you may give me some excuses, like so-and-so didn't do their work. I'm going to say, that's fine. Let's not talk about why it's not. Like, just give me the options of how we can get this goal met. Yes. And you may give me a dozen options. And then I'm going to ask you, point blank, what will you do and when will you have it done? Love and it. you are now the sole driver. It would have been much more satisfying for me to walk in and say, hey, come here, let me talk to you. Why are you so lazy? Why can't you get your work done? You're just a terrible journalist. You said you'd get that done on Monday. You just suck. Oh, man, that felt so good. But it never got the problem fixed. Nope. And I love that. All I did was focus. I focused on your character. I never focused on the problem. Yep. So as long as I tell you what my situation is and let you tell me how we're going to fix it and hold you accountable to fix it, guess what? You're going to fix it. And that's how you go from $54 to $10 million, right? You trust people and give them the tools. Yes, you don't need to micromanage. And I love that you said, let's not worry about who did what and what. How are we going to fix this? What are we going to do to get this resolved? That's what I love. I hate when people spend like a half an hour on a call trying to throw someone under the bus or, you know, put them on, you know, under the freaking 
police light and you know yeah. oh well why didn't you do the well such and such was supposed to do it and they didn't and why didn't you and you know it's just so stupid so i love that you yeah. said that um yeah they're not they're not focused on getting the business in the right direction right. everybody's kind of focused on watching their butt exactly oh my god people if you are an entrepreneur this is some like gems right here yeah <laughs> <laughs> So how do we spot the difference between real and fake culture? So let's think about it this way. Does having a beanbag in the office make it a cool culture? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. How about free food? Yeah. Free beer? Free I, wine? Yeah. So, I, yeah those I are like all that. things. And if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom two are physical needs and safety. Physical needs are, are you, are you fed? Because if you're hungry, you can't solve my problem, right? Mm -hmm. If you said to me, well, I don't have enough money to eat, well, you're probably not going to get that article written on Monday, right? Right. And your safety, you need to have safety. So safety comes in the form of health insurance or um, retirement, but it's also just your personal safety. If your house got broken into yesterday, are you going to solve my problem today? Probably not because you don't feel safe. Those two things are are easily described as culture, but they're not. You get that from any job. So if I say, hey, if you work for me, you get free coffee, free beer. Uh, I own a brewery, so you get free beer in my office. And I also own a winery, so you get free wine. You have all this stuff you have access to, video games, foosball tables, bean bags, and people look at that and go, wow, you have an amazing culture. Mm -hmm. Nope, we just have stuff, more stuff. An amazing culture comes when you move up that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, and again, where I call it BAM, right? Mm -hmm. People want to belong to something bigger than themselves. They want to be affirmed. And when I say affirmation, I don't mean like, oh, it's 3.30. Let me walk around and tell everybody good job. It's telling people when they're doing a great job. It's telling them when they're not doing a great job. Um, so to stick on affirmation real quick, we quit doing um, annual reviews. We quit doing quarterly, monthly. We quit doing weekly. We started doing instant, real-time reviews because you wouldn't do that with your children, right? I, if my son destroys the bathroom, I'm not going to wait for three months and say, oh, now, son, I need to talk to you about the time four weeks ago when mm -hmm. you destroyed the bathroom. Like, that doesn't even make any sense. Yep. Um, and people want their work to mean something. They, they want to be part of something it doesn't matter if they're doing the most menial job in your business. As long as that means something to moving the organization forward, they'll help you do it. Mm, I love everything that you're saying. I wish I worked there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's company. how we kept our retention, right? Exactly. Oh, my gosh. So what do you think your purpose is at this stage in your life? So I'm doing a lot of um, speaking around the country. And so if your listeners are looking for a keynote to come to their city, uh, have them call me, mm -hmm. uh, which has also led me to be able to do a lot of angel investing. I love working with startups. And so my purpose is um, I really didn't have any help getting to where I got. And not that I didn't ask for help. People just, they just don't know how to help people. And so I... I knocked on the SBA office. I went to my local chamber. I did all the things that people tell you to do, and nobody understood how to do an online business because it was so young. And all I wanted to know was how much do I charge? Like, I don't even know how much to charge. I'm not a business person. I'm a teacher. Um, and so I've really dedicated, like, you know, I feel like the next phase of my life is if I can just go help a handful of entrepreneurs then they can change the trajectory of thousands of other people. Mm. And that's my goal right now. Phenomenal. And perfect. Love it. So what are you most surprised at about the path that your life has taken? What has surprised you the most? Where you still sit back and say, damn, I can't believe that happened. Yeah, I do. I do sit back and go. I'll be honest with you. It's because I don't have a rear view mirror mm -hmm. in my life. So it's hard for me just to pause and go, wow, we've done some pretty amazing things for being 43 years old. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's like, oh, my God, I, I have so much more to do. I, I have an accomplished Jack. I, I'm still that little kid, you know, growing up in a little town that 
still is trying to prove to everybody that he's smart and can do something, right? And I think that's how a lot of entrepreneurs are wired, and that's what drives us. I've tried to turn it off. You just can't. I can't turn it off. If somebody can figure out how to turn it off, let me know. <laughs> we tried. Uh, we tried hanging out in Napa, drinking wine all day, and there's only so long you can actually do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. You always feel like you have more to do, but that's good because what you're doing is amazing. You know. So well, thank you. <laughs> this is the Oh Hell No podcast. So I always ask my guests to share an Oh Hell No moment that they've had along the way. Um, I know that we have Oh Hell No moments all the time you had a couple oh hell no moments one with your royalties <laughs> one with your parents when they were like oh hell no you're gonna be a teacher <laughs> you know so yeah. that is what an oh hell no moment is it's a moment where you're just like taken aback by whatever is going on you know it could be between two people something someone said to you an offer that was made whatever but it can also be a positive thing like when someone called you and said hey we want to buy your company you're like oh hell no i can't believe this you know so share yeah. something with us that you haven't said during this interview i think my greatest oh hell no moment was um when i told my parents that i was going to marry my eighth grade pen pal. Mm. And so you can imagine that my parents, you know, being an Indian family had an idea of who I was going to marry, not who, but an idea of what this person would look like. And, uh, my wife had a project. She's from Nebraska, had a project where she wrote, uh, my eighth grade English class and everybody in the class wrote her back. And I was the only one who kept writing back and forth and we became best friends. We had never seen each other and I met her my freshman year of college. And I decided before I got off the plane that this is the girl I was going to marry. And so you can imagine the shock when I was the first minority on her side of the family mm -hmm. and she's the first American on my side of the family. Wow. That was a real all oh, hell no moment because it was like, <laughs> you know, my folks pretty much said, don't come home. Like, wow. you're on your own. Don't come home. And so, you know, when I hear entrepreneurs say, you know, I need a half a million dollars before I can quit my job and make my business. I tell them, oh, hell no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a teacher, a parent, paid for my own college, started my own business, and nobody was there to help us. And we did it all on our own. So, I mean, when I sit down and I look around, it's like, you know, I didn't have to get anybody's help. Like, we were completely 100% self-made, even in raising a family. And I'm just proud of that, right? I have that oh, hell no moment every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're amazing. And let's not forget, you cook dinner, damn it. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, do, you I'm were, actually go, getting ready to go cook some hamburgers for the family right after this call. Yeah, you're like working a full day, coming home and cooking. You're awesome. Trust me, because no, that's a big thing. Um, it was such a pleasure having you on the show. And thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. But please tell us, where can we buy the book? And how can we get in touch with you? Keep in touch, you know, see all the things that you're doing. Do you have a website or you want in, um, social media? Let us know. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, you can buy the book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, at the airport. It's, uh, lead your tribe, love your work. Um, and if you like it, give us a five star. If you don't, give it to somebody you don't like. <laughs> and then uh, uh, you can follow me uh, on all the, you know, all the fun social media. Uh, Patel OKC is what most of them are or some variant of that but if you go to um lead love tribe.com you can uh, connect with me there on all the different social media programs that are out there yes that is great